who serve a risen Savior who gave his life so that we could be forgiven. We come to worship him with grateful hearts. We serve the creator of every good thing that exists. We come to worship him with grace and grace. We serve the everlasting Father, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, and Prince of Peace who is God over everyone who would be God. We come to worship him with all our hearts. Let's join in singing hymn number one, praise you the Lord the Almighty.
You know me, I'm full of questions, right? I always ask questions. And the first question I have for you, if you read the bulletin, how do you get what you want? Listen, people, this is really important. <laughs> you ask and wait for an answer. How about you? some reason you didn't get that. Well, yeah, maybe not just you getting hurt, but somebody else might have gotten hurt at the same time. And, and God, Jesus actually tells us, I wanted to have, bring my Bible down, I forgot, but in Matthew chapter 7, uh, Jesus actually told the disciples and the, the thousands who were on the, uh, heard the Sermon on the Mount that day, have you heard of the Sermon on the Mount? where Jesus went up on the mountain and many, many, many people followed him and, and he gave this great big sermon that day. And part of that, he, toward the end, he said, ask and you shall receive. So if there's something we want, we should go to God and ask. Now, can you think of another name for asking God something that Yes. Praying, exactly. And uh, so Jesus, when he says ask and seek and knock, he's actually saying pray to God. He's told us many times in Scripture, pray, pray, pray. But God, like a good father, might not always give you what you are asking for because it might hurt, hurt you or someone else. Or maybe the time isn't just right now. Maybe he has a better plan for you in the future. And so, uh, but it all begins with asking. And that's how to get what you want. And with God, the answer is always going to be for your best. Okay, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for these young, young people who are so dear to you their families. I ask, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, that you would open their eyes to all the spiritual things you have in store for them, and that you would give their parents great wisdom and knowledge and understanding to know how to raise them, and their grandparents also. And we pray this, Lord, not just for these families represented here, but all families in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Oh. This is Noisy Coin Collection. So 
if you'll go grab the buckets, there's one up here and there are a couple in the back and we'll, um, we'll collect that. Not, not person to person, but just go get the buckets. Does anybody put anything in? Okay. collecting person by person. We're just bringing the buckets up. Oh, that's well. We're filling. What? We're filling them. We're filling it. Okay. <laughs> I tried. Yeah. I tried. <laughs> Christ, for which I am in chains. 
Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that one, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Here ends those readings. something a little different today. Before I went to seminary, I never used a, a, you know, a printed out message. I always just spoke from the heart with a bit of an outline. And seminary really ingrains it into you to write it all out and then you basically just get back. So I'm trying to get back to my roots of, of just speaking and letting the Spirit lead me, although I have prepared, believe me. I've done the preparation. Uh, Joe knows, every time he turned around, it was like I was down on the swing, you know, reading and praying and working on this. But um, I wanted to, to let start today with a story about some Christians, a group of churches who lived in this one community, and they wanted to have an ecumenical service outside in the summer, and they wanted to use the public park to do this. So they went to the, um, the town council and they, they gave a petition uh, saying, may we get a permit to use the ground to do this service. Well, there was also an organized group of atheists in this town, in this community, and they went to the town council and they said, they petitioned the town council, don't give them the permit because of separation of church and state. Well, what do you think the Christians did? Rather than countersuit and go back against the atheists, they just said, we'll pray. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for our town council. We'll pray for this community. And the response of the atheists was they went to the town council really fast and they said, please make the Christians stop praying. It gives them an unfair advantage. <laughs> Sadly, in our age, our prayer meetings have all but vanished. It used to, we used to sing about sweet hour of prayer, right? Uh, maybe some of you are old enough to remember. I don't. But I know that there used to be prayer meetings in the churches. Uh, actually, uh, where I served, I was constantly being reminded, Presbyterians don't do that. <laughs> we don't pray publicly. Well, thank God, I, I don't see that here. You know, uh, when, when I was here the last time, and we opened up prayer for everyone, everybody, you know, a lot of people prayed for our nation and for us, for what was happening. So, uh, you know, I don't see that here, but I think that even here, just because we are living in the 21st century America, we have been conditioned so much not to pray for certain things that we are losing the battle simply because we're not using everything God's put at our disposal to use. And so you may have guessed today's sermon's gonna be about prayer, right? <laughs> Don't you now. I know that some people find prayer very dull, very boring, very uninteresting, but it's not. And let me tell you why. If you picked up an outline, you have the quotes from E.M. Bounds. Uh, I have this book with me today. I'm going to put it, I don't know if you want it up front here or on the tables in the back. This book is all of eight of his volumes on prayer. And it's a treasure. And it's, it's excellent about, you know, to encourage you to pray and how to pray. And so you can tell when I was researching for my book, I, I used this quite a bit when it came to the chapters on prayer. But this is just a little bit of what he had to say. 
Prayer secures blessings and makes men better because it reaches the ear of God. Prayer affects men by affecting God. Prayer moves men because it moves God to move men. Prayer influences men by influencing God to influence men. You get the picture. And then he says prayer moves the hand that moves the world. And he also said prayer lays its hand on Almighty God and moves him to do what he would not otherwise do if prayer was not offered. Let me read that, that one one more time. Prayer lays its hand on Almighty God and moves him to do what he would not otherwise do if prayer was not offered. And the, the, uh, the, the, where he gets this idea is from the prayer that Moses prayed in Exodus. Now I know with Pastor Dave you know, working through Exodus uh, not too long ago, uh, I'm sure this is probably one of the passages he talked about, but let me just read it to you to remind you of, of what's happening. This is right after the, the, all the plagues of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea, and God brought his people, the Israelites, out of bondage and slavery to freedom by a mighty display of his power. He led them to Mount Sinai, and now Moses is up on the mount getting the law and the temple, the directions for the temple and everything else they were going to need. And what happened? Less than 40 days, they rebelled against God. They made a molten golden calf. They made a gold and made a calf, and they said, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt. God was angry, and rightly so. And this is what he says to Moses up on the mountain. And the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Of course, Moses hasn't witnessed what's going on down there, okay? <laughs> he hasn't witnessed this yet. He gets, when he does see it, he gets a little bit angry himself. But he's, he's saying, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with Evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and relent from the, this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. God's righteous wrath, what Israel did, demanded God's righteous wrath, his judgment. Moses gave God the, the circumstances he needed and was looking for to give him the opportunity to show mercy. This is what we forget so often today. Sin brings judgment. There's no if, and, or but about it. Sin brings judgment. What God was about to do to Israel 
was perfectly justified. And Moses prayed, and he turned, he gave God what was needed to take a different course of action, which was to show mercy. That's what prayer does. Let me hear, uh, I want to share with you what, um, what um, um, Brother Andrew, anybody here know Brother Andrew from the 60s, 70s, maybe 80s? Okay, Brother Andrew uh, worked primarily in Europe and smuggled Bibles into behind the Iron Curtain. Okay, if you remember back then, uh, Bibles were forbidden. In, in Russia and all the communist lands, that communist bloc. And he smuggled Bibles in. He prayed quite a bit. And this is, this story about Moses is what gave him the idea and the wisdom how to pray and how to do this. Listen to what he has to say about Moses. Moses, the true intercessor, doesn't accept a word from the Lord judgment as the word from the Lord, the final word. He understands God's character. He knows God to be reasonable, merciful, and true to his word. So he reminds God of his word and his promises, and that from the human perspective, it would look like God is destroying the very people that he protected and just brought out of bondage and set free. God changed his plan because the circumstances changed. Moses prayed. Brother Andrew concludes, so you see, in interceding for his nation, instead of accepting God's plans as final, Moses changes history. Now, most churchgoers today, I don't know how how far along you are and, and you're thinking along these lines. But many churchgoers today do not know God's character well enough or his will well enough to know how to pray like Moses prayed. Or if they do, they don't have the courage and the boldness to pray it. We're a little too timid perhaps when it comes to this. The United States, if ever there was a time in the United States that this kind of prayer was needed, it's now. We have so, we have turned our backs on God. Our technology, our pleasure, our entertainment, our comfort are our gods. And they are the ones who set us free. We are reaping what we have sown. As far as, and, and you know, I'm not saying this is a word from God, but from what I read and see and hear, my personal feeling is the turmoil we're seeing in our streets is God's judgment poured out on this nation. He has given us what we said we wanted, and this is the judgment. Do we have to sit by idly and let it happen? No. Do we go out there militantly fight against it? No. That wasn't Moses' way, and that's not God's way for his people. Prayer is the weapon. God has, we have, we have sacrificed close to 50 million babies on the altar of inconvenience in this country since God was removed. We have human trafficking, we have human, uh, we have drug trafficking, we have uh, almost any sexual sin that people can imagine is not only approved, but it's out there paraded in the streets for everyone. I'm sorry, this is a difficult thing to face, but we have to face it if we're going to do anything about it. And that's what this message is about today. It's about Moses' prayer and how it can be our prayer 
and how the church can really be effective in our age and in our day, in our nation. That if this is God's judgment on this country for the ungodly things that we have done and rejecting God since the 60s, don't accept it as the word. Okay? Like Moses, go to prayer and pray. Pray knowing the character of God, who he is, what he desires. Pray his will. Well, when I've tried to get people motivated to join me for prayer meetings, okay, and I've tried, uh, I, I hear a lot of excuses, okay? And uh, some of them I want to share with you today. One of them is, uh, I'm too busy, right? I'm too busy. I don't have time to go to a prayer meeting. Or, it's not my thing. Okay? I've heard that one quite a bit. Prayer is not my thing. And mostly from men, excuse me, but usually it's the men that will say that. And to you, to, to I'm saying you with generic you, not you, specific you, uh, but to the people who say these things, and maybe you, you hear it, and this is an answer you could give them. It's a matter of priorities. Where are your priorities? If God and prayer are a priority, you'll make time for them. Some other things I've heard is that God doesn't want to hear from me. I'm insignificant. My prayers don't matter. And to those uh, excuses, I would say, who are you believing? Are you believing the lies that people have told you or Satan has told you? Or are you believing God who says, of all people, pray? Pray. Pray without ceasing. That wasn't given to just the disciples. It wasn't given to just people who find it easy to pray or are delighted to pray. That was a command given generally to all people. Think another uh, excuse that I've, I've heard in, in churches, um, people, it slipped into our thinking in the church because it's so prevalent in humanistic philosophies that come from the Enlightenment, not the Bible. And it says that people are basically good. And we just need to educate them and they'll do the right thing. Okay? I hope no one here has bought into that. But, again, uh, the, what they're, I have even heard it taken so far as to say, if you pray, for the salvation of someone. You're implying they're lost, and therefore it's offensive and it's judgmental. Again, it becomes a matter of belief. Whom are you going to believe? The Enlightenment philosophers, the humanistic philosophers of our age, or God? God, who is the creator of all things, who is the source of all the, of the greatest beauty and wholeness and healing that we have, who is love and grace and mercy and peace, but he is also holy and just and righteous. And because of that, no sin can enter his presence. And Paul has penned in Romans uh, 3, 21 to 26, since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Evil, we have all sinned and fall short of God's perfection. Right? Anybody here think you're on level with God for perfection? If you are, we need to have a serious talk afterwards. Pray for you. <laughs> Pray for them. But we, you know, what do we believe? Do we believe this to be true? And the only way we can have the righteousness and the holiness that is needed to be in God's presence is through Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. And when we believe in him, he declares us holy and 
blameless and without accusation. In Jesus, when we come to him and accept him, we are declared to have the righteousness that he has. And that is the only way that we can make it to heaven and exist in God's presence. But you will hear people say, using John 3.16, the first half of it, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I hope you're wise enough to know, bring those people to the next part of it that says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then they will say, well, but, but God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. You're right. Verse 17 says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. Point them to verse 18. God says, Jesus was saying, those who believe in me will not be condemned, but those who do not believe in me are already condemned. God doesn't have to condemn them. They're already condemned. We've condemned ourselves by sinning. What do you believe? And are you familiar enough with God and his word, his character and his will to stand effectively in this day and age with the half-truths that you're going to hear? Another um, uh, objection that I hear to prayer is that people are uncomfortable praying out loud. Now, thankfully, I haven't seen too much of that here or any of that here. Uh, but a lot of times people are uncomfortable or you don't know what to pray or you don't know how to pray. Uh, you worry that you might make a fool of yourself. Or you're afraid of being judged by others. And folks, if anybody judges somebody for the prayers that they pray, heaven help you. We need to have a talk. God's character is so important that we know God's character, we know his will, and we know then how to pray. And the only way we can know his character and will is spend time with him in his word. So pray the scriptures. That's a good, solid place to begin with prayers, if, if any of these you know, are keeping you back. But that also presents another problem. Perhaps we misunderstand scripture, just like I just went through with John 3, 16 through 18. Okay? Some people may misunderstand the scriptures. They've only read a part of it instead of the whole thing. And so listen to what... Um, uh, another example that I have here is, is uh, from Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus is talking on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, go into your closet and pray. Well, I have, especially in Presbyterian churches, where I mostly, you know, spend my time, I hear we're not supposed to pray publicly because we're supposed to pray in our closets. And I'm, to the person who says that, you should say, look at the context. What was Jesus doing? He was talking about the Pharisees who stood on the street corner and prayed in loud voices with his long and flourishing and, and fancy prayers so that he could be heard and adored. And everybody was saying, oh, wow, what a great person this is. Jesus was objecting to that and said, you know, to that person, you better go in your closet and pray. He was not mandating for all time and all places that we not pray gathered together in, in, in a public place. Then uh, we come, what is the will of God? Jesus, in that same, um, same message, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come. 
we're praying for God's will to come. But what is God's will? Sometimes we need to be a little more specific than just your will be done. My mind, I, there are times when I just don't know what to pray anymore, and I, I, I go to that. That's my default setting. But that shouldn't be our regular setting. We need to identify specific things and connect it with God's will and be praying. Today's passages do just that. They point out for us one specific thing that Jesus commanded the church to pray. This is God's will. It's not the only thing in God's will. Okay, this is one part of God's will. And in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35, we read that Jesus was going all around the villages, preaching and teaching the word of God, healing their diseases, casting out demons. And he sees the people, and he is really moved because they're like sheep without a shepherd. They're wounded. They're crying out. They are so hurt. And he wants them to be healed. He wants them to be cared for. And so he turns to the disciples and he says that we are to hear our, our the, 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 he says, the harvest is plentiful, meaning there are lots of souls out there ready to receive the word of God, but the workers are so few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he would send workers into the field. Here we have a specific prayer for a specific thing, for a specific will of God. This is something we should be praying together as a church. Moving a little bit forward from this, at Pentecost, after Jesus ascended, what do we find? The twelve gathered in the upper room. And if you read scripture carefully there, it's not just them, but it's the women were with them. Uh, Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, was there and his brothers. So to begin with, think it's not what stretched to think maybe two dozen people to start were praying in this upper room. They were praying for the spirit to fall. Remember Jesus said, wait for the power on high. And so they were praying about all this, that he told them. And so there, there they are for 10 days between Ascension and Pentecost, praying for the Spirit to fall on people. And we all know what happened, right? They were joined later by uh, more and more people. By the time Peter gave his first message, there were 120 that had gathered. Now they probably were no longer in the upper room uh, all sorts of things, could, conjectures could be made here. Uh, a, a big home that had a courtyard, and that's where the 120 were gathered. Yeah, who knows? But uh, Alan and I were having this discussion before last night about um, God doesn't give us all the details, but he gives us what we need to know to understand the message. So how the 120 fit into the, the room, we don't know. They probably moved. It's not a big deal. Um, so some people, though, get hung up on stuff like that. Have an answer ready for them. And uh, then we move on, and, and Peter, at the end of that 10 days, he stood up and he preached a wonderful sermon, and 3,000 people were brought into the church in one day. 3,000 souls were saved. We don't see the need to gather together to pray. From there, if you move on to Acts 6, you see that, that um, the disciples, this is where they, they uh, raise up, up seven deacons, uh, Stephen and Philip were two of them, uh, so that the disciples, the apostles, could do what? Devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. The gospel goes forward on those two things. 
not just good preaching, but prayer that moves the hand of God to move people and the preaching. Okay? This is vitally important that we understand this as a church. And then uh, we have, um, we, saw, we see also here in our passage today in Colossians, Paul, who had great success, how many mission, three mission trips, wonderful success, he planted churches everywhere he went. He constantly asked for prayer that he could proclaim the message of the mystery of Christ, that doors would be open for him to do it, and that it would be clear that people would understand it. Folks, are we praying like this for our pastors, for our elders? Are we praying like this for one another? Salvation is a work of God. Prayer moves God to move people. And it's not just you who's going to move. We see this in Judges, where the people, things were good, they fell away from God, and what happened? Things got bad. They cried out to God, God heard them, restored them, Things were good again. And they did it again and again and again throughout the whole book of Judges. We see it in Israel. And if you read uh, Daniel chapter 9 and um, um, what is it? Um, I'm looking for Nehemiah. I always get him and Nahum confused. Nehemiah chapter 1. Beautiful prayers for the nation Israel. Turn to them, model a prayer for the United States after what they pray, using our 21st century language and our 21st century situation. But the model is there, it's the same. In fact, scholars have noted that every move of God, hear this, every move of God was preceded by concerted prayer by his people. One of the, uh, the things that really struck me was back in the 1700s, the Moravians formed, and they, for the first 100 years of their existence, had a 24-7 prayer meeting. They had a place, a chapel open, and they kept, people went there and filled in, and for 24-7, 100 years of prayer, for God's word to go forward. And out of that, we see people like Charles and, and John Wesley who were directly affected by their ministry. And they, in turn, started the, um, the, um, um, the Methodist Church and revival in England at that time. We see George Whitfield, who was part of that group with uh, the Wesleys, and he came to the United States and went all up and down the eastern seaboard of the American colonies. And the, we know it now as the Great Awakening. Have you ever heard of that? If not, look it up on the internet, okay? I don't want to take time to explain it to you today. The Great Awakening, where God just mightily moved and turned people's hearts back to him. Out of that also was Jonathan Edwards, who in his church in Northampton, in 1734, the Great Awakening started about six years later in the 40s, 1740s. And this happened in his church and was really the precursor to the Great, America, uh, the Great Awakening in America. And he advocated for concerts of prayer everywhere to prolong the move of God. And he was effective in influencing Scotland and the, the outbreak of God's work there and renewal there, revival. And I brought this, if anybody's 
interested in trying to start a concert of prayer, this book, it's hard to find. It's written, uh, it's a contemporary book. Uh, Edwards talks about it, but his language could be a little hard to understand if he wrote back in the 1700s. So anyway, this is another book that you might want, it tells how to organize and how to do a concert of prayer. How to actually, the kinds of things that you should be praying and, and doing in that. So Billy Graham, how many of you re remember before Billy Graham would go to a community and have a crusade, he would have the churches praying for revival in that area. It was common. Do we do it today? Are we doing it? If you want to see a move of God, you need two things. You need powerful preaching and you need powerful praying. That asks what that that prays for those things that that Paul wrote to the Colossians for open doors, for the message to be proclaimed powerfully and clearly. I want to close with a, a uh, back to Ian Bounds <laughs> and um, just let you close with this. These are Bounds' thoughts on prayer. Prayer is a disinfectant and a preventive. It purifies the air. It destroys the contagion of evil. It is a voice which goes into God's ear and it lives as long as God's ear is open to holy pleas, as long as God's heart is alive to holy things. Bounds claims that our prayers are eternal and reminds us that God shapes the world by prayer. Prayers are deathless. The lips that uttered them may have been be closed in death, the heart that felt them may have ceased to be, but the prayers live before God. And God's heart is set on that. And we know that to be true, right? Read Revelation. The incense was the prayers of the saints. Prayer is never a waste of time, but continues to bear fruit long after we have left this world. I want to close with this one other observation that Bounds has made, and this is tough to accept perhaps, but think about it. His observation on the church in prayer is that he reminds us that as partners in God's work, Christians are in not a little measure responsible for the conditions around us. He asks Bounds, are we concerned about the coldness of the church? Do we grieve over the lack of conversions? Do we grieve over the lack of conversions? Does our soul go out to God in midnight cries for the outpouring of his spirit? And if the answer is no, then part of the blame for the way things are lies at our door. If we do our part, God will do his. Around us is a world lost in sin. Above us is a God willing and able to save. It is ours to build the bridge that links heaven and earth. And prayer is the mighty instrument that does the work. Folks, do what Paul wrote in Colossians 4. Be steadfast in prayer and be watchful in the same. And then, Bounds ends with, and so the cry comes to us with insistent voice. Pray, brothers and sisters, pray. Pray that God would send workers to bring in the harvest. 
Pray for the harvest of souls. Pray for your pastors and your elders and yourselves that doors would be open and that the gospel would be proclaimed clearly and powerfully. And that people would hear it. Please stand and join with me in our next um, our next um, hymn, 358, I believe it is.
join me in prayers for the people. Gracious God, please join me with a prayer for new hope. Gracious God, we pray for our pastor and for all our leaders that they would be godly men and women devoted to prayer and that you would open doors so that the message of the mystery of Jesus Christ people to, to uh, have their financial problems uh, erased or, or answered or solved uh, is wrong, but Lord, there's more. There's more. And help us to walk into all those things that you have for us to be doing. Forgive us, Lord, when we draw back out of fear or worry. Dear God, Help us, make us bold. We lift up those who, who need you right now for Kate Lip, uh, Lee Hart, and Rita and Kenny, Jamie Kesey, our nation. We are broken. We have tried to go on our own. We have put you out of the public domain and we thought we could handle it. And we Felt we knew better than you. Have mercy, Lord. Instead of your wrath and judgment, which is justified, forgive us. We confess that we have been wrong. Lord, have mercy. Give our leaders wisdom during this time and bring unity and healing to this nation. Father, we lift up the church around the world that is being persecuted on so many fronts. Be powerful on their behalf. And may your word continue to go forward even as Paul asked that the ministry of the word of Jesus Christ would have many openings and be received give you the glory. We give you the praise. We give you praise for those watching over us as um, as Kelsey moved this, this week and uh, held down and others with their, their sore bodies as, as we're just not uh, as able to do things as we used to do. Praise you, Lord, that the financial situation is solid, even though things have been less, less than secure here. We give, we give you the praise for um, the PNC and the work that they are doing, and that you will lead them to the right person at the right time, um, who will lead this church mightily in your ways. We pray, Lord, for favor and that the appraisals and, and every all the legal things that need to be done uh, and this driveway put in in a timely manner would take place. Open the doors, Lord. Make it so. And we give you the praise. We give you the glory. And now we pray the, the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ gave the church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the night is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And 
please remember, uh, if you haven't already done so, leave something in the plate here or in the back uh, as you go out.
forth and be Moses and pray for your nation even as he did for his. That may the power of our Lord Jesus Christ come upon you, the love of God who sent him to us to redeem us through the power of the Holy Spirit to go forth with boldness and courage. <clears throat> Amen. Thank you.